سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah be on all of you. We have great pleasure in having Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips with us at the Islamic Research Foundation. Dr. Bilal Phillips was born in Jamaica, but he grew up in Canada. He has written more than 30 books on various topics of Islam, like Fundamentals of Tawheed, Evolution of Fiqh, Essays of Ibn Taymiyyah on Jinn, The True Religion, best of Islam, and so on. Dr. Bilal Phillips, how and why did you start writing? I began writing out of a need and a necessity. Having graduated from the Islamic University of Medina, I began teaching Islamic studies in private schools in Riyadh. And um, I found that there, was, there, were, there were not sufficient materials for, for me to teach with. I had to create my own materials. So I started the process then of transforming that, or transferring that knowledge which you know, I had gained in Arabic into English medium. So I started to prepare notes, etc., etc., for my students. My father was the uh, vice principal of the school in Riyadh at the time. He was not a Muslim at the time, but uh, because it was an English medium school with an Arabic section. And he used to edit the notes for me. He would go over and guide me because what happens is that um, when you study in a language, right, in Arabic, for example, the, the way in which Arabic writers write, you know, they, they, they write, it's quite different from English. And if you, tra and you translate, you tend to translate the style also. And it just was very awkward because in, in Arabic, there are no periods. Right, you know, mm -hmm. sentences just run one right into the other. So you'll mm -hmm. find one sentence will go for like two paragraphs, you know. Mm -hmm. So it became very clumsy. So my father's editing, you know, improved my writing style, you know, as I prepared materials for the students. And then um, I reached a point where I had, you know, written, this was, uh, I'd started writing, collecting the materials from 1980s when I started teaching. And uh, within the first year after I made my initial collections, I realized that this material really needs to be in the Muslim world in general. Actually, mm -hmm. the book on Tawheed, the fundamental Tawheed, was, was put together from 1980, though it wasn't published until 1989. Mm -hmm. you know, it, the, idea, the basic book was put together then because I was using it, the material to teach my students. And um, I sought publication institutions to publish through, uh, the uh, evolution of fiqh, which I, I wrote after that, also for my teaching materials. I tried to publish through the conventional uh, publishing companies in the Muslim world at the time, but I, I found great difficulty. You know, People would sit on the manuscripts for one year and then tell you, well, no, you need to change this and change that, and you know, I, I wasn't able to, to print. I eventually found, was obliged to publish myself. You know, so my initial writings, the first books, which I, two books which I published were the Polygamy, Polygamy in Islam, and uh, The Devil's Deception. These were the two which I published initially, based on uh, publishing myself. I went to England, I did some of the typesetting in, in Saudi Arabia, some of it in England, and then published it in the United States. Fundamentals of Tawheed is your most popular book and it has been reprinted in India as well. What, is the, what are the issues you have covered in the book? Well, the fundamentals of Tawheed address the basic areas of, of Islamic understanding of the unicity of Allah, you know, and, and issues that are connected to it. Yes, Allah is one, all Muslims know Allah is one, but the uniqueness of that oneness has been lost to many Muslims. So that a person may believe Allah is one, but does Allah being one mean? So the book deals with the, the uniqueness of Allah's oneness in terms of all of his attributes, and then the different ways by which people fall into shirk. You know, because if you, when you look at one side, you need to look at the other side. When we say, La ilaha 
illallah. We have the bo both sides are there. We deny the false gods and we uh, confirm the one true God, Allah. So the book deals with both aspects. And then I touched some of the major issues in the Muslim world today which affect and destroy that foundation of Tawheed. I dealt with issues concerning the amulets, uh, which you refer to as ta'wees, whatever, these things that are connected to it, which people will wear around their necks and their arms and things, the waist of their babies and things, to protect them from evil. I discussed this, the omens, people take omens from different things, you know, uh, and I also went in to deal with issues of magic, because uh, people are involved in magic and its connection with the jinn, fortune telling, fortune telling which is very, very popular amongst Muslims today, though fortune telling is something forbidden in Islam. And then I also dealt with issues of affecting the correct concept of Tawheed in the Muslim world at that time, until today. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the central theme that you have conveyed to me in Islam? Why did you choose to write another book on the same subject? Well, actually, at the time, maybe the book Polygamy in Islam is relatively new here in India. But the time I wrote it, you know, I wrote it, uh, published it, it was 1985 or 86. There were no books on polygamy. You know, there were some pamphlets, but there was no book which went into it in, to de in detail. And for me, who was involved in da'wah, this was the big question which was always coming up in my face. As soon as I tried to talk to non-Muslims, oh, you Muslims have four wives. Why four wives? So I felt this book, would address this issue. And also there were these apologetic Muslims who were into this thing saying, yeah, it does say in the Quran four wives, but the Quran also cancels it. So really Muslims are not supposed to have more than one wife. Actually, the Quran recommends monogamy. I think Yusuf Ali in his tafsir, his commentary on the Quran, he sort of implies that and mentions it in the commentary of the verses. So this was a common misunderstanding amongst Muslims. So I was trying, I, I wrote the book to clarify both aspects. One, that polygamy is a part of Islamic marriage and, and should not be denied. It was not abrogated. So I clarified that for Muslims and clarified the misunderstanding. And at the same time, for non-Muslims, I gave the rationale, because actually the book was called the, um, the rationale, originally it was called the rationale behind uh, multiple or plural marriage in Islam. That's how, that was the total title. Later on, it was just changed to polygamy in Islam. Because plural marriage, people were, you know, what plural marriage? You know, so I said polygamy, <laughs> just switched to the word which people mostly understand. So there I clarified the rationale for it. You know, what does Islam put forward in defense of taking this position? You have translated into English Ibn Taymiyyah's essay on jinn. And your PhD was on the subject exorcism in Islam. What is the significance of this subject? I mean, do we need to know about jinns when we don't necessarily deal with them in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, this is a question that has often been raised to me, you know. Why put all this effort? Two books, you know, which have to do with the jinn and things connected with them. Well, Ibn Taymiyyah's essay on the jinn, when I translated it, this was about 1990, it was mm -hmm. translated and published. I did it at a time when there were no books on the jinn at all. It couldn't be found in the marketplace, really. So I wanted to put something out in that area that people, I, I realized that there was some confusion in the Muslim world about the world of the jinn. I heard so many different stories because by that time I had been traveling, giving lectures from the Philippines to Guyana in South America, you know, all over the Muslim world. And I was hearing issues of the jinn coming up, you know, time and time again. And uh, it, it was some area which was very confused in the minds of the people. So what I tried to do was to get some clarity there. I mean, even myself, I had some confusion. So I tried to get some clarity. And I made it the topic of my PhD thesis, because actually, when I found the material for Ibn Taymiyyah's essays, uh, this was in the course of preparing material for my thesis, which was on exorcism in Islam. You know? 
So I didn't want to wait until I finished the thesis to publish and then bring everything all together. So I went ahead and did Ibn Taymiyyah's essays as a complete text. There are portions of it which I've used in my thesis subsequently. So it provided some clarity in the different areas, because Ibn Taymiyyah addressed this topic quite comprehensively, it, it, for, for people who had a lot of these misunderstandings to clarify it. Because though you mentioned that it's not very so important in our lives, or doesn't seem to have that much importance, the fact of the matter is that it does have importance. In fact, Allah has referred to one chapter, one chapter has been named in the Quran as Surah Al-Jinn, in our whole chapter of the Quran. And, and there's so many places where the jinn are mentioned that if it weren't important, then Allah is not going to speak about it, right? But the reality is that the world of the jinn comes in contact with our world on a number of different levels. And this is what creates much of the confusion, you know, in, in different elements among the non-Muslims, for example, the apparitions that they see, the visions that they have. They see visions of Mary and the Christ child, you know, which confirms for them their beliefs. Or, you know, a year or two ago, the, the, um, the idol, uh, Ganesh, started to drink milk. Uh, this happened in India, isn't it? Right? It happened also in Dubai, where I was, and a number of different places. And, and people not understanding the influence of the jinn in, in this way, wherein it can possess people, you know, can possess objects, it can appear in forms, uh, then uh, people are misled and mis uh, misguided in this manner towards acts of shirk, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran that he created the death and the life, the life for the purpose, for the purpose of, of testing us. Of testing us. Taqwa and truthfulness, humility and repentance, kindness and gratefulness. Are you prepared for the final exam? Are you ready? Generosity and tenderness give true value to life. To answer the most important exam that you will ever that face. Will ever face. Dr. Jonathan Cazales. Live your live life, your life purpose. on purpose. Learn to utilize every moment of life to make it meaningful and precious in Live Your Life on Purpose. Tomorrow, at 11.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. A die dynamic. I challenge any human being to point out a single fundamental of Islam. In Youthful quest. Which is against humanity as a whole. Iconic, inspiring, encouraging. Don't judge Islam based on the following. Farik Naik. Judge Islam based on the authentic sources. That's the glorious Quran and, and the authentic Hadith. Son of the world famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, Dr. Zakir Naik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an opportunity to do a proper job and to earn a proper reward. A star above par in Teams Star every Friday at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. Pearls of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Narrated, Usman, may Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet, may peace be upon him, said, the best among you are those who learn the Quran and teach it to others. Sahih Al-Bukhari, Volume 6, Book of Virtues of the Quran, Hadith number 5027. So it provided some clarity in the different areas, because Ibn Taymiyyah addressed this topic quite comprehensively, it, it, for, for people who had a lot of these misunderstandings to clarify it. Because though you mentioned that it's not very really so important in our lives, or doesn't seem to have that much importance, the fact of the matter is that it does have importance. In fact, Allah has 
and refer to one chapter. One chapter has been named in the Quran as Surah Al Jinn, in our whole chapter of the Quran. And there's so many places where the jinn are mentioned that if it weren't important, then Allah is not going to speak about it, right? But the reality is that the world of the jinn comes in contact with our world on a number of different levels. And this is what creates much of the confusion, you know, in, in different elements among the non-Muslims, for example, the apparitions that they see, the visions that they have. They see visions of Mary and the Christ child, you know, which confirms for them their beliefs. Or, you know, a year or two ago, the, the, um, the idol, uh, Ganesh, started to drink milk. Uh, this happened in India, isn't it? Uh, it happened also in Dubai, where I was, and a number of different places. And, and people not understanding the influence of the jinn in, in this way, wherein it can possess people, you know, can possess objects, it can appear in forms, uh, then uh, people are misguided in this manner towards acts of shirk, etc. So the book on the jinn helped to give clarity in that area. And my thesis, the PhD thesis itself, I went into an even wider approach. What I did was, the first part, I dealt with the, uh, the, the world, the spirit world, the world of the human spirit, this is the, uh, and the world of the angels, and the world of the jinn, in, in, in identifying the qualities, the origins, the abilities, the, the interactions of these worlds. Then I went into a section dealing with uh, possession. Can a person be possessed? Is it possible for possession to take place? Because there are people who have denied it in the past. And then after you know, confirming that it is real, it is something confirmed historically by the Prophet Muhammad himself. And then I went into the methodology of the Prophet Muhammad in dealing with such people, people who are possessed. What was his methodology of exorcism, which means freeing a person from that state of possession by uh, foreign entities. In the course of that study, I did uh, research in India, this is 1989, I came to India, I went to Hyderabad, I, went, I came past through Bombay, to Calcutta, to New Delhi, etc., going to the libraries and collecting up manuscripts of the past on these subjects and researching it, and also interviewing uh, Muslim scholars or whatever who claimed to exercise people according to Quran and Sunnah. I met them in Pakistan, in Karachi, in Lahore, Islamabad, you know, and I sat with them, did interviews with them, collected up their information. I also went to Egypt, to the Sudan, to South America, and collected up people who were involved, their, their explanations as to what they're doing, why they're doing it, what is the evidence for it, so on, so on, so So a part of the book is field research, you know, into the exorcists and their traditions. And then there's a comparative study also in Christianity, I went in to look at exorcism in Christianity, and the Catholics have a long tradition of it. Then I compared their findings with the exorcist's findings, with what the Prophet Muhammad said, and what the Quran and the Sunnah clarify, mm -hmm. and then brought out conclusions as to what, in fact, is the correct method Islamically for dealing with these situations, and how do we understand the exorcisms of others? Because you have Christians who will exercise in the name of Christ and a person is cured. People will exercise as Buddhists and Hindus. Others will exercise also. So how do we relate that to exorcism, exorcism in Islam? I try to deal with all of these issues. Before going into exorcism, you've said that uh, the aspect of possession has been proved traditionally, historically, from the life of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Is there any scientific evidence to prove that jinns can possess men. I, in the book, I also bring, you know, evidence from, from modern psychiatry, you know, Western medicine. That's a section also comparing what are their findings. Because the, the changes that a person goes through, which is identified as possession by those who believe in the possibility of possession, these changes are also observed by modern psychiatrists, etc., etc., and they have their explanations for it. So I went and looked at it and identified their arguments, etc., etc., and compared and showed 
that in fact they do recognize that there are, there are some other entities within these people, you know, they call them split personalities, multiple personalities, etc. But they, they think that they're dealing with personalities of that same person, just, just separate personalities. But in fact, even in their modes of treatment, they are not really able to successfully treat these people. And um, they have been obliged, even in, in, in court cases in America, where people have done things where the other personality is in the forefront to, to, uh, uh, to make rulings on the basis that that was a separate person from the actual known person in that community. You know. So I pointed out that uh, these, uh, it is an issue of interpretation. Western psychiatry interprets it one way, but the realities are undeniable. That this, something is happening here. Whether you look at it as the individual's personality splitting and then a new personality arises and you explain because it's in childhood this happened to him or whatever and so on, so on, so on. But the reality is that you're dealing with somebody who is completely different. A person who may need glasses to see. You know, if you take the glass off, they can't see properly. I mean, I mean when you really get into it, you can see that this, this is something which is really beyond just another personality different facial expressions, and all these kind of things that are connected with it. Now, there are specialized people called amils who use various means like uh, amulets, or there are systems where you know, people who are possessed are beaten by peacock feather and so on. And there are various means of exorcism. Is this legitimate, according to Islam? Well, the book looks at the methods of those who claim to do it according to Quran and Sunnah, and then identifies that which is and that which isn't. Now, what you're describing, the use of amulets, beat either, though this has become a common practice in a number of parts of the Muslim world, where they will beat, inflict pain on these people. They say, well, we're beating the jinn, we're not beating this person. But I did interviews with the patients, <laughs> you know, who had bruises, etc., on their bodies and that, and, and they said it hurt. The people were telling, no, it didn't hurt you, it was hurting the jinn. But now the person comes out and says, it hurt. You know, and we have basic principles in Islamic teachings that, you know, you're not allowed to inflict harm on another Muslim. Al-Muslim, man salim al-Muslimuna man lisanihi wa yadi. The true Muslim is one from whom other Muslims are safe from his hand and his tongue. So we say, this is breaking that principle for you to be beating people, inflicting harm on them, and say you're beating the entity in the person. And the person comes out and they're suffering. We say this is not legitimate. And uh, of course, in India, I know there are a number of other methods. They involve, you know, tying people's hair, putting mustard seed in their faces, and tying their toes and their fingers, and clipping here, and saying they're burning the gin, and you know, all kinds of things. <laughs> but uh, of course, this is uh, a lot of theatrics, which mm -hmm. is used and can psychologically effect a cure, because much of what is identified as, as possession is not. Even from the people who are working very close to the Sunnah, I did surveys amongst them, and they've, in, in most cases, they were saying maybe only about 10% or 5% of those people who come to us are actually possessed. Much of it is psychological. You mentioned there is some contact between mankind and the world of jinns. Is it possible for me to go and shake hands with a jinn or something? Well, it, it may happen. But the point is where the problem comes, is that the jinn are really forbidden from entering into our world and interfering in our world. Only Prophet Suleiman was given control over the jinn. This is a dua he made recorded in the Quran. And even Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he was attacked by the jinn, and recorded in Sahih Bukhari, etc., and he kept the jinn off himself. He said he thought to tie up the jinn so on the post so people of you know, the masters so people would see in the next, the next morning. But then he said he remembered the dua of Prophet Suleiman and he backed off, which was that Allah would give him control and power which would not be given to anyone after him. So no one has control over the jinn. So you'll find stories, people say, oh, I have a good jinn in my house. He comes and cleans my house, you know, and you, know, you have stories like this. You're here in the villages, you know, but there's no good jinn like this. The evil jinn, in order to get into people, to get in to influence them, they may do some things which appear to be good. You see, even the people who are involved in evil in general in the society, they never introduce their evil directly to people. 
Because then people would say, oh, this is evil, let me stay away. No, they come off as being very good, very nice, offering some good things. 